Howdy everyone, my name is Griffin Furlong. I'm a professional engineer in the state of Florida and welcome to episode six of the land development series. In today's episode, we will be continuing on to part two of site planning. The main goal of this video is to show you how we start thinking about laying out a 90 acre residential neighborhood, which includes the right of way, the roads and the lots. We will use our knowledge that we learned in the previous episode. So if you haven't checked that video out, I highly suggest you do so. But I'm ready to dive right into it, so let's get to it. So one of the first things that we're actually going to start out with when we're laying out a site plan, especially for this large residential site, is really just a simple calculation of how much space we have to develop. I'm already looking at the left side over here and I see that it's getting tight between this existing easement and the wetland buffer. So there is a minimum amount of space for us to even fit any sort of right of way, any sort of easement and any sort of lot. Same goes over here. There is a minimum space right here where we can actually fit all the necessary products. And whenever you hear me say products, it's all about what the developer's trying to build, where they're, they're a home builder and they want to sell lots, or if they want to sell a commercial warehouse, anything of that matter, whenever I say products, we're usually talking about some sort of building that's being sold. So let's actually just start over here with a really simple calculation of what we can fit between this little corridor here. I'm noticing that one of the smallest amounts of area that we have is generally right there. So I'm going to do DAL for a dim aligned, and all that does is help me get a dimension. I'm gonna be really rough. Let's see, I'm gonna do nearest, and then I'm gonna take a dimension to about there. How much space do I have? So I have about 221 feet to fit something through there. Okay, now let's take another dimension over here. Now it's looking as if, let's see, between maybe that point there and some point over here, we only have so much space. So I'm just gonna go back. And again, this is kind of rough. Usually initial site plans are fairly rough. It's usually an iterative game. And even a lot of concept plans are done by hand. But normally what I would do is print off a PDF of the survey and start hand drawing some things. But I wanted to show you guys how you can start doing a little bit of this stuff in CAD. So how much space do we have through at least that corridor? Because look, it, it's, you know, that's most likely our tightest spot there. I want to start over here first. What can we actually fit through there? Well, if you remember from the last video, we found our minimum right of way width based on the municipality's land development code, which was 50 feet. Now we've coordinated with our clients, our home builder, and they wanted us to use a lot depth of 130 feet. So let's do the math there. If we need to fit a right of way and a row of lots, we're gonna need 50 plus the 130 feet. So let's start breaking down some of these calculations. So let's say if we had 221 feet, I shouldn't need a calculator for this, but we're gonna do 221, minus 180. How much do we have left over? We have about 41 feet left over. Now, one thing that we need to keep in mind is the room needed for grading. We can't just back up a lot right next to this wetland buffer. We also just can't have right of way up against this easement. We need room for our grading. So when you're trying to develop a site plan, you're also trying to think about having a conservative amount of space so you can actually fit your product within the spacing. So I have 40 feet left over. Now, one thing I forgot to mention is that we're going to need a public utility easement on the outside of this right of way. If you don't know what that is, I have a whole video about cross sections. I highly suggest you check that out. But a public utility easement is going to allow all of those dry utilities like your fiber optic, your cables, electric, all that to come through that easement. So I'm going to take that 40 feet that I had left over. I'm going to subtract 10 feet out of that. So technically, I only have about 30 feet left. So if I split that off on both sides here, I only have roughly 15 feet on both 
sides to play with, to actually sneak in right of way, a lot, the 10 foot public utility easement, and just have some space left over so we can meet our grades at the buffer line. Let's kind of look at this other side here. So this other side is a lot more space. We got almost a thousand feet. Well, you know, we're trying to maximize the number of lots. And you know, the way that I'm looking at this site, again, every site's really, really different guys. So, you know, it's all about understanding the shape and the overall feel of this site. The way that I'm feeling this site right now is I sense that we're going to have some ponds and some water management. We're going to have to sneak in some of those ponds. So I'm kind of seeing, you know, some right of way that wants to come up in here and loop around just like this. Uh, you know, we got a nice square in here to actually fit some right of way and some lots. So I, I'm, I'm thinking off the bat with a thousand feet. I can probably fit one, two, three roads. So, so three right of ways, let's talk about that. So if I know that the right of way is a minimum of 50 feet, let's do three times 50, that's 150 feet. Now I'm gonna see how much room I have left and see how many rows of lots. I'm basically solving for X. How much space do I have and how much space can I fit in? So if I have a thousand, let's do this, 1,028 minus 150, for the roads that I need. I have about 878 feet left over. So how many rows of lots can I make? Well, if I told you that all of the lot depths are 130 feet, let me divide that by 130 feet. So I got 6.75. So roughly six rows, I'm not getting, I'm not getting seven. So roughly six rows, right? But see, before I go too strong with saying that there's gonna be six rows of lots and only three roads, one thing that typically gets overlooked, especially by, by planners, and I'm not throwing shade to planners, but usually the stormwater management area for ponds is overlooked, especially for a residential subdivision. Now, a great rule of thumb is typically 20% of your site needs to be pond area. And again, where does the 20% come from? This typically relates to the required treatment volume that you need. So you know, once we actually run our first model iterations, because uh, we run a stormwater management model, we will be able to determine if we have to go back to the drawing board for more pond. And in most cases, having ponds at your lower points of your site is ideal because typically all of your finished grades will be based on the pond staging. All of these wetlands are the low points. So I know for a fact that I want to sneak in some pond around this wetland here, definitely around this wetland. This looks like a good pocket to add a pond and then maybe even somewhere over here, some sort of pond, because I know just based on looking at this, that this is most likely going to become a cul-de-sac road with some lots that circle around. And we need pond in order to actually capture all of the oils and greases that come off the road, treat it, before we discharge it right into the well. Now, before we go way too far, I think I need to talk about a couple of really important things. So number one is actually access management. Where will the project be accessed from? If you are a civil engineer and fairly new to this game, you need to be asking the following questions. Number one, are we connecting to private or public right of way? So this is an existing boulevard in this project that we hope to connect to. It looks like there was a driveway stub out for this purpose for you know this project. So this project was planned ahead of time to provide stubs of driveways or roadways into our property. This road happens to be a public right of way, meaning the municipality owns and maintains everything within that right of way. Now, let's say if this was a private road, meaning this private road's owned by, by some sort of legal entity, then we will need an agreement and additional coordination that could end up taking months, a year, depending on if you know this person or entity. Uh, so you always wanna ask if it's going to be private or public. Now, you also wanna ask if it is a state road. Now, what does that even mean? Well, that means that the state owns it. So instead of a local municipality like a county, a state road is even bigger. It's owned by your state. So for instance, since we're in Florida, if this was a state road, it would be owned by the Florida Department of Transportation. Now, why is this important? 
Well, a lot of times when you try to permit a connection or permit any sort of drainage around your connection, this can typically require an extensive amount of permitting. This is never ideal solely because of how long these permits can take to get, and there has been a history there. Those who know anything about FDOT knows that it takes a bit of time. All right, so the second question that you need to ask is, do we need a second point of access or an emergency access? Now, this typically has to do with safety. A typical standard we have in most municipalities I work in is that if the project is serving over 100 units, we will need some form of emergency access. Well, what is the reason here? Well, let's say if an emergency evacuation happens, 100 homes has a lot of people in it. And if everyone is leaving at the same time, this can create a bottleneck in one point of access. So let's say, you know, if I only had one point of access and everyone's trying to escape some national emergency or disaster, well, now we're creating a bottleneck. And even if it's not an emergency evacuation, just having another road to leave through is kind of like having a back door to get out and in case anything's ever going on. So having that second point just gives you some flexibility to escape another zone. A couple things that I also wanna to touch base on when you're developing the site plan are cul-de-sac lengths. Sometimes municipalities require maximum cul-de-sac lengths, so I can't have a road that stretches way too far. Lastly is block lengths, and some municipalities have maximum block lengths, meaning there can only be a stretch of homes for so long. Why? Well, it creates a dense environment. It creates a long walkway of just homes and it starts taking away from your open space and walkability. And again, some municipalities are just very stringent on those types of rules. So always consult your county land development code. But I'm not a city planner. I am more of an engineer. However, I know that these are things that I look out for. Now, if I were to do this whole site for you guys, it'd probably take me more than an hour or two or probably even more than that. So what I'm going to show is just, you know, how I would start thinking about laying out this right of way, the lots and the ponds over here. Like I said, we have 221 feet. I know that I want to start making a cul-de-sac along here, and I'm going to use this existing easement line as a just a boundary point and this wetland buffer. So the first thing that I'd kind of do is I'm going to start by just drafting uh, a polyline, and I kind of just want to start hugging the endpoints of this line, and that's going to serve as our constraint. I can hit A for arc. Let's see. Okay, it did a little arc for me. Let's see if it does another little arc right there. So that is my my constraint right here. I'm going to start just doing some simple offsets. And again, if you remember, I need 10 feet for a public utility easement. So I'm gonna do 10 feet offset. Let's see what happens there. And I'm just trying to get a feel for how these offsets are gonna look. So now I need my 50 feet of right of way. Let's do a 50 feet of right of way there. So that's our right of way right there. Okay. And then now let's do our offset of 130 feet and just start get an inkling of, of how this looks. So it, it for sure looks like I can fit, in fact, a 10 foot PUE right of way and then this 130 foot lot. And I, it even leaves me some, some room right there. So let's figure out how much room I have left. So we got about 30 feet, which is funny because that's exactly what I said in the beginning. So that is how you can start getting an idea of what you can fit in here. And again, this will be an iteration. You know, I know for a fact I can't really fit any lots in here. Even if I sneak this around, you know, I'm not fitting any lots. So this happens to be a pretty good area to place a pond. And usually what I do for ponds is I'll hug my constraint and I'll start developing a cross section of how much space I need in order for the pond not to grade within the wetland buffer because we have to stay out of this wetland buffer. So this definitely looks like a really good place to have a pond. And again, guys, this is just very general right here, but this is how you can start thinking about your your site plan. I'm going to press C for close. So I know that I can have some sort of pond in here. And again, when I, when I shape this pond, I'm going to use some fillet radius tools to smooth out some of the curves along this pond. But the way I see it is, you know, we can have a pond 
collect all this road drainage, sneak it through the lots via a drainage easement and have it come right into here. And the reason why I like the ponds close to the, the wetland is because it creates an immediate outfall. I know that this pond is going to have an outfall box that drains directly to this wetland. Now, if I go up kind of north here, I can tell that I'm losing a lot of space. If I just have my lots over here, I'm not really gaining anything over here. So I might want to consider reducing some of this and trying to see, you know, what sort of lots I can actually pick up through here. And again, guys, a lot of it is just iteration and seeing what you can fit. The way I visualize this is maybe this cul-de-sac kind of curves over and maybe we have, you know, maybe these lots right here just wrap around. But like I said earlier, we definitely need some pond here. So I kind of see some, some pond that might actually need to be over here close to this wetland. So I'm going to start kind of generally doing a little shape of pond. You know, I kind of want to save some, some room for a pond. Where I want to start is up here because I know for a fact I can start wrapping some lots along this property boundary here. So I'm going to start wrapping some of these lots around. Again, leave some room for a pond. Now, since that blue line's my property boundary, I know that I can't grade outside of those limits. So one thing I need to do is just make sure that I have enough buffer space there. In this site plan, we're not required to have any sort of landscape buffer because we're just backed up against floodplain and wetlands. So we don't need any sort of buffer or setback here, at least per, per this municipality. However, I kind of do just want to give myself maybe 25 to 30 feet because, you know, what that does is if you grade four to one, that gives you anywhere between five to six feet that you can be up in the air. Now, I don't know how high we're going to be yet because we still have yet to generate our site plan, walk through the stormwater management model and all the drainage. But, you know, you want to give yourself a buffer early on because you would hate to have your lots just be right backed up against the boundary. And then if you're three feet high, well, you're going to be grading in outside of your property boundary. So uh, always think about the space that you need around your, your property boundary. Now, one solution you guys may say is a retaining wall. But who wants to pay for a long retaining wall? throughout this property. That just adds unnecessary costs. I'm going to give about 20 feet. So the way I'm kind of seeing this is I, I want to wrap some, I want to wrap some lots around this. So again, I was kind of doing some, some really rough sketches in here, uh, but I, I decided to kind of show, you know, where I got with smoothing out some of this right of way, turning the right of way in order to actually fit some, some lots in here. Uh, found out a good way to squeeze my pond in here just to kind of show you guys what I was initially thinking about wrapping the lots around here and having this pond to collect the drainage. Let me kind of turn some of these other things on here. So we were able to sneak in this right of way, some 10 foot PUE in these lots and even have enough space so we're not impacting this wetland buffer over here. Here's the smoothed out version of that initial pond that I drafted. Just started smoothing out some curves. So now that pond's going to serve to drain all of this roadway, these lots, and the, the rear yards of the lots. If you guys are interested in more of a commercial side, what I can start doing is start switching a little bit of focus to the commercial realm. So if you're, if you're interested in that, please drop a comment below. I'm really interested to see what you guys want to see, whether it is more residential or more commercial. I'll be totally happy to pivot. That's all the time I have today, guys. I hope you learned something new, and I hope that this is helping any upcoming drafter or engineer. I know that typically people don't learn this in school. Land development is a very special field where there are not too many courses out there. So if I am helping, please hit that like and subscribe button. It really, really helps me, and it keeps me motivated to keep teaching you guys something new. But that's all I got for today. In the next episode, we will finally be diving into the fun engineering stuff like sanitary, stormwater, drainage, all that fun stuff. But we had to get through the site planning efforts in order to get where we're at today. 
That's all I have for today, guys. I will see you in the next episode. Peace. I be working nine to five, working, 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 working nine to five. Yeah, trying to stay alive. I be working.